Well, 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 this is it. My last video on one of my all-time favourite games, Final Fantasy X. I captured 10 of every monster, I beat everything the monster arena could throw at me, and I took down every dark Aeon in spirit. However, there are still two more super bosses which have yet to be beaten, and then I'm done. First, there's Nemesis, the ultimate monster arena creation. Nemesis only becomes available to fight after capturing 10 of every monster and beating every other creation in the arena, which I've already done. And then second, there's the mysterious being known as Penance, ominously hovering above the calm lands and now available to fight now that all the Dark Aeons have been beaten. Now, it goes without saying that these two super bosses are the toughest enemies in FF10, having the highest stats and HP, meaning that if I wanted to take them down, then I was also going to need some pretty impressive stats myself. Thankfully, my party was already in really great shape due to all the grinding and general preparation I'd had to do to stand the chance against the harder original creations and Dark Aeons. As you can see, I didn't bother with break HP limit, but that's because you don't need to break HP limit to beat any enemy in this game. It does make it easier, but also means you'll need to grind more. And thus, due to feeling sufficiently well prepared, I thought why not just bloody go for it and take on Nemesis first, to see how it goes. No preliminary fannying around, let's just get it done. The model for Nemesis is taken from the model for Omega Weapon, only instead of having a black and silver coloration, its new reskin is an extremely cool black and gold. Genuinely one of the coolest looking enemies in the game, I think. As you might expect, Nemesis stats are no damn joke. For a start, it has the second highest HP of any enemy in the game, at a massive 10 million, with Dark Anima coming in in third place with 8 million and Penance having a ridiculous 12 million. But hey, could be worse. Nemesis has max strength and magic with very high agility and high defence stats. One mercy with this enemy however, and something true of pretty much everything in the monster arena, is that it doesn't have high luck at all. The luck stat affects crit chance, accuracy and evasion, and as we saw with the Dark Aeons, an enemy with a decent luck stat can be a massive pain in the arse to fight because if your party doesn't also have respectable luck, you'll just never be able to hit them. Anyway, a simple fact that I quickly accepted with this fight was that most of Nemesis attacks would kill their target, with the exception being its regular physical attack, which was survivable due to auto-protect. Ethereal Cannon is a single target attack which always annihilates its target, but due to it being single target and us having auto-phoenix, this was nothing to worry about. Next, there's Ultra Spark, which absolutely destroys everyone and also causes a bunch of status ailments to the whole party. But, due to the fact that this attack is guaranteed to kill us by dealing damage equal to around 3 times everyone's max HP, the status ailments are irrelevant. You can't be poisoned if you're dead. Then there's its physical attack, which isn't threatening at all, is easily survivable and doesn't do any status ailments, so always nice to see this one. Nemesis can also use Ultima, but only as a counter to overdrives. However, due to my party's magic defence stat being very high, Ultima was survivable with Shell, even though Nemesis' magic stat was maxed out at 255. Nemesis' last and rarest attack is Armageddon, which does a fixed 99,999 damage to everyone in your party. Now, here's the thing that makes Nemesis not a difficult boss. It is very predictable. For a start, the only two attacks you need to worry about at all are Ultra Spark and Armageddon. However, when you realise that Nemesis will only ever use Ultra Spark after Ethereal Cannon, it immediately removes the threat of the attack, and that's because of all life. This is why Riku is so important when taking on the hardest enemies in FF10. It's because she's got some insanely powerful mixes, and one of her best mixes is Hyper Mighty G, which among several beneficial status effects or cast all life on your whole party. Thus, whenever I saw Ethereal Cannon used, I knew that all I had to do was make sure that Hyper Mighty G was used before the next attack, which I knew would be Ultra Spark, and I'd be golden. Thanks to the triple overdrive ability inherent in every celestial weapon, and the fact that Nemesis does such huge damage with Ethereal Cannon, building my overdrive gauges was no issue at all, and I had everyone set to the Comrade overdrive mode 
to ensure more consistent overdrive building. Although Tidus and Orin were also building overdrives, these really weren't useful for this fight due to having to deal with the Ultima counter, and also because the damage from them just wasn't impressive enough to justify using them, especially due to the turn delay from using overdrives. Of course, even with the predictability of Ultra Spark, there was also the issue of Armageddon, starring Matt Damon and Bruce Wallace. I didn't actually realise it when fighting the boss, but this attack has a pretty interesting points mechanic. Its other attacks either add 2 or 3 points to a hidden counter which triggers the Armageddon attack once that counter reaches 21, and when this happens, Armageddon will always be used on the next turn. I think I only saw Armageddon once or maybe twice throughout this fight, but even though I wasn't aware of the counter mechanic, I still didn't get surprised with it, because when it did get used, it just happened to be after Ethereal Cannon, so I was expecting my party to be annihilated by an Ultra Spark anyway, meaning that I was always prepared with auto life. And so, my verdict on Nemesis is that this is not a difficult fight. It looks intimidating, has huge stats and HP, and some crazy attacks, but because its attack patterns are so predictable, it was just really easy to manage. Even if my stats were a fair bit lower, I still don't think this would have been too difficult, even without Hyper Mighty G, because I could have just cast Auto Life manually, or even sacrificed Aeons when expecting an Ultra Spark or Armageddon. The fight took about 16 and a half minutes, and I got a couple of Dark Matters and a Heaven's Cloud weapon for Orin. There's also a whole song and dance with the Arena Dude when you finally do beat Nemesis, and he congratulates you and gives you a useless key item called the Mark of Conquest. Thanks, I guess. Okay, Nemesis was done, which meant just one more super boss to go. Penance. Once you beat all the Dark Aeons, there's a cool cutscene showing Penance rising up from the clefts in the earth over Camlands, and from this point on, you can actually take it on directly from the airship, similarly to how you can choose to fight Sin earlier in the game. Another interesting thing about this fight is that you can actually escape it any time you like with the Flee command, the same way you can at the arena. Whereas the models for almost all the toughest monsters in FF10 are just reskins of other monsters or Aeons, the model for Penance is completely unique and very cool and weird. I mean, what the hell even is Penance? Is it a monster or a machine? I don't know, but I do love the design. Although Nemesis stats were very impressive, Penance... Penance? Penances? Penance's stats blow everything else out of the water. It has 12 million HP, maximum strength, magic, agility and accuracy, and massive defence stats. On top of this, it has two arms to deal with, both with half a million HP each, and also with huge stats, including very high evasion. Also, both arms have their own movesets, each designed to fuck up your party in different ways. And to top it all off, even when an arm is killed, it'll simply regenerate a certain number of turns later. Like with Nemesis, I thought, what the hell, let's just give it a shot and see how it goes, just as a test run. And I made it about a minute before everyone was obliterated by the attack, uh, obliteration. And that was the end of that. I decided that Penance must have just gotten lucky though, and so went back in for another round. I lasted longer this time, but just wasn't getting anywhere. The arms were getting too many turns off, I was spending too much time recovering, some of my attacks were missing, and then the right arm cast Mighty Guard on Penance, which was no bueno for me, because that comes with regen. Thus, I used Flea and got the hell out of there. Although I had great stats and equipment, it was clear that this was a fight where I'd need even better stats, more specific equipment, and a solid strategy. Now look, I'm not going to pretend I designed this setup, because I didn't. I actually got it from Dan's G08's channel, because it was the strat I'd used years ago when I last beat Penance. But for a start, I needed different equipment. The stuff I had on was great against the Dark Aeons, but wouldn't quite serve for Penance. For a start, Auto Phoenix would be useless for this boss, because if things are going correctly, then no one should die throughout the whole fight. Efficient use of turns is crucial for the Penance fight, and if people start getting knocked out, then their next turn is greatly delayed, even with Auto Phoenix, and we can't have that. Also, Ribbon or Stoneproof is also not needed here. It absolutely would be important if we were going to fight Penance whilst keeping the arms alive, but that's not what we're going to do. Instead, we don't want to let either arm get a single attack in through this entire long fight. So I ran over to Maclanator Woods to get some Tetra armor from Wants, 
and then got to work customising it. First I stuck on auto potion into the new equipment which was very inexpensive to do, only requiring 4 stamina tablets each time. The reason for auto potion was that I wanted to ensure everyone would fully heal themselves up every time they were hit, and by using trio of 9999 combined with auto potion, anyone would automatically heal themselves up to max HP with a basic potion after each attack from penance. Next I wanted auto protect, and this required a massive 70 light curtains for each piece of armour. It didn't actually take too long to do this though, because beating the Fafnir creation at the arena with an overkill would net you 40 light curtains at a time. Auto Protect is there to give us the extra physical defence necessary to survive any of Penance's attacks. Remember, if anyone dies, it's a massive headache and very difficult to recover from. By that same token, the next ability to be customised onto everyone's armour was defence plus 20%, and again this was needed to make sure that everyone could survive any attack. If everyone had break HP limit, this wouldn't be necessary, but we don't. And so even with 255 defence, defence plus 20% is a must. And lastly, of course, auto haste is essential for any super boss in this game, because due to the inconvenient fact that Penance's arms always regenerate after a certain number of turns, you want as many turns as possible in between that happening to actually do some damage to the main boss. Auto haste is very expensive to customise unfortunately, because you need a massive 80 chokeable wings for each piece of equipment, and to get all those I had to bribe the Meishi enemy from the Omega Ruins with an awful lot of gil. An awful lot of gil. And so everyone was finally kitted out with their new equipment, and hopefully ready to go. So without further ado, I flew back in for another round with Penance. I kicked off the fight by using a 3 stars to ensure that we didn't run out of MP. This was important because I'd be using quick hits any time I'd attack, and also because an attack Penance uses later on in the fight also drains MP. I decided to try out a Blitz Ace on an arm just to test out the damage, and to see if it'd be worth using, however I was not at all impressed and decided it wouldn't be worth using this overdrive at all. Around a minute into this fight, I noticed an issue. Both arms were still alive. With Owen's last turn, he managed to take out the left arm, but then the right one was still kicking, or punching, due to it being an arm and not a leg. And so of course the right arm immediately petrifies and shatters, Titus. Cool. Effectively ending the battle. So not what I'd call a roaring success. As usual, I decided to jump straight back in for another go, thinking that I just needed to be more effective in taking out the arms faster, but unfortunately I still couldn't get enough hits in to achieve this before one of the arms got a turn. One of the reasons for this was that every now and then, one of my attacks would miss. My accuracy stats were very high and my luck stat for everyone also ranged from 75 to 85, which was pretty damn good. However, it clearly wasn't good enough, because any miss would be unacceptable for this fight, because every turn had to count. Unfortunately, this meant only one thing. Luck farming. One of my least favourite things to do in this game. Farming for luck is utterly tedious, requiring you to grind the Greater Sphere for Luck Spheres and then the Earth Eater for Fortune Spheres. Both these enemies are very slow to fight due to having counters every time they're hit, and they also have very high HP. And then there's also the obnoxious fact that there's a 1 in 8 chance that you'll get Dark Matters for beating them instead of a Luck or Fortune Sphere. My luck was already pretty damn high, so I settled on increasing everyone's luck by a further 8 points, and so by the end, Tidus and Riku had 82 luck, while Orn had 93, which I was pretty satisfied with. Thus, I was finally prepared to take on Penance for real, hopefully. And the final battle began. Because of the importance of taking out the arms as quickly as possible, I decided to skip trio of 9999, 3 stars and ultra null all to begin with, because those could be used once the arms were dealt with. And so, 
Every turn at the start was spent attacking the Yarns, and I was glad to see that all attacks were now consistently connecting. Penance did get off an obliteration attack on me, but because of my max defence, auto protect and defence plus 20%, everyone was able to survive it. See, if you take the arms out of the equation, Penance itself literally only has 3 attacks. There's Obliteration, which does high damage to the whole party, then Immolation, which it only does in Phase 2, which does high physical and MP damage to a single target as well as full break, and then there's its ultimate attack, called Judgment Day. Judgment Day can only be used when both arms are alive and will do max damage to everyone in your party, though it can be survived by sacrificing an Aeon or with all life. I'd love to show you it, because it's an extremely cool attack, but I made sure to not ever see this attack due to me constantly taking out the arms. Look it up though if you've never seen it before. It's sick. The general strat for Penance is actually quite simple. Once you're set up with 3 stars, trio of 9999 and ultra null all for extra luck, then it's just a case of always prioritising taking out the arms whenever one regenerates. The only time to ever directly attack Penance is when both arms are dead, and as soon as one comes back, immediately work on taking it out again. The damage done to the party will be automatically healed up thanks to Auto Potion and Trio of 9999, so no extra turns should be necessary to recover from damage either, and it's very important that you're never missing any attacks. You don't want to be 30 minutes into this fight and then lose because an attack missed and now an arm has gone and attack in and ruined everything. After losing a quarter of its HP, Penance will move on to phase 2, where the bottom half of its armour breaks off, meaning that it will now only use its second attack, Immolation. This attack is single target and causes full break, but should still be survivable, as long as you're remembering to cure up full break with Dispel. Of course, this means that you're having to spend an extra turn each cycle using the spell instead of getting an extra attack in on Penance. However, the upside is that due to Immolation being a single target attack, Titus or Orin can now counter it if they happen to get hit, whereas they can't counter Obliteration from Phase 1. From this point on, as long as you're sticking to the strategy, always taking out the arms, always curing full break, you can't really lose the fight. In fact, to be honest, it became pretty damn tedious, because even though Penance itself has a massive 12 million HP, most of your attacks will be on the arms, extending the length of the fight. Being Penance took me about 50 bloody minutes, and it seemed like it was never going to end, but eventually Riku ran in and delivered the finishing blow with a nice overkill, spelling the spectacular end of Penance. There's no special reward or lame key item for beating it, although we do get about 2 million AP, 41 Dark Matters, and 10 Master Spheres. What a journey. You know, even though no one really watches these videos and I'm basically just talking to myself at this point, it's been great documenting my journey to do all the hardest stuff in FF10. These are quests and bosses that I've done loads of times before as a teenager and through my 20s, but always in the privacy of my own room. Whereas now I've got a YouTube channel and can share my experience with other lovers of this incredible game. And so, for anyone who is somehow still here at this point, as always, cheers for watching and cheerio.